Income tax 2022-2023. Itemized deductions, home mortgage interest. Get ready and some coffee so we can stave off the government attack with income tax preparation. Well, maybe we can't stave them off, but we can at least, we could slow them down a little bit, I think. Most of this information can be found in the instructions for Schedule A Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Looking at the income tax formula, we're focused on what I would call the below the line deductions, more specifically the itemized deductions. Remembering the first half of the income tax formula is basically a funny income statement. Most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income, here having income minus minus various deductions resulting in taxable income. Remembering deductions for taxes are good, therefore we're typically looking for more of them. One of the major differences between the types of deductions include the fact that the adjustments to income or above the line deductions do not typically need to clear a hurdle such as the standard deduction before they are beneficial to the taxpayer, whereas the itemized deductions do typically need to clear the hurdle of the standard deduction before they become beneficial. First page of the Form 1040, we're looking at line 12, the greater of the standard deduction or itemized deduction. If the itemized deductions are greater, then we would be populating them on the Schedule A. The Schedule A are the itemized deductions. The list of the deductions are on the left, although this is not the whole schedule. These are the standard deductions, the hurdles that we would have to clear in order to be itemizing, which are tied greatly to the filing status, such as single, married, filing joint, or head of household. Single filing status has a standard deduction 13850, married filing joint, doubling that to 27,700, head of household in between 20,800. If they are uh, older than a certain age or blind, then we have single filers could have one or two of those items, which would increase the standard deduction. As we can see on the right, married filing joint would have four separate items that could apply because there's two people involved, the standard deductions on the right and so on. So we're gonna be continuing on with the interest, looking here more specifically at the mortgage interest, remembering the general idea of an income tax would typically be, to be fair, we would tax the net income, meaning we would, we would be allowing deductions for those types of things that were necessary in order to generate the income, which we can see clearly on say a Schedule C for a business income, which is an income statement where we have income minus expenses, which are basically business deductions and are applying the tax rate to the net income, not to the gross income. With W-2 income, then the idea is that the employer is providing the expenses and therefore we're not writing off uh, the expenses. The Schedule A has a bunch of items on it that deviate from that general idea for various different reasons that you can argue whether they be valid or not. But the idea now is that we have some of these personal items that you would think personal in nature and therefore wouldn't be natural deductions for an income tax, but are included nonetheless in the code. Things like charitable deductions where they're trying to nudge us to uh, give to charity because they don't think we would if otherwise I, or something like that. It seems kind of insulting to me. I don't know. But then we have, of course, the mortgage interest. Now, the interest you would think that if we took out a loan for purchase of equipment that we used in a business, the rent on the equipment would be a normal business expense. But we also get the personal purchase of the home and the mortgage interest on the home possibly to be deductible. The argument being that owning a home is like the American dream was the argument and so on. I would think a large part of that was also lobbyists within the housing industry that wanted to subsidize the housing industry, which they did quite well with that, which probably increased uh, the housing prices and made it a little bit more complicated in the long run to decide whether or not you can afford a home. But that's first a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't wanna be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. 
like this CPA thinking cap, for example, CPA thinking CAP, you see what we did with like with the letters and this CPA thinking cap is not just for CPAs either. Anyone can and should have at least one, possibly multiple CPA thinking caps. Why? Because based on our scientific survey of five people, all of whom directly profit from the sale of these CPA thinking caps, wearing this CPA thinking cap without a doubt, according to the survey, increases accounting productivity tenfold. Yeah, at least. Yeah, apparently the hat actually channels like accounting energy from the quantum field ether directly into your head, allowing you to navigate spreadsheets faster. It's kind of like how in like the matrix when Neo learns Kung Fu, or at least that's what the scientific survey's saying. So get one because the scientific survey participants could really use some extra cash. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. It's kind of where we are at this point in time. So when we look at the deduction of interest, the mortgage interest is going to be the big one. That's going to be the one if someone owns a home that might push people over from taking the standard deduction to the itemized deduction, especially when you combine the mortgage interest with the with the property taxes that are state and local taxes, which also might be itemized deductions. So let's get into the weeds of the mortgage interest tip. So if you are a homeowner who received assistance under a state housing finance agency hardest hit fund program or a emergency homeowners loan program, you can see publication 530 for the amount you can deduct online 8A and 8B. So oftentimes when you get into the purchase of the home, you can get into like government, you know, incentivized areas where they're trying to help people to afford a home and so on and so forth. And then you get into these questions as to whether or not if you've got some kind of benefit, then should you also get the tax deduction, right? You get these overlaps that end up happening and things can get quite complex relatively quickly. So a home mortgage is any loan that is secured by your main home or second home, regardless of how the, how the loan is labeled. So when we think about a home loan, for most people, the home is gonna be their largest uh, investment typically. So that means most people have one home in order to be purchasing the home, they're gonna have to take out a loan or mortgage and then in order to finance the loan or mortgage, they're gonna be paying interest. The interest is the thing that is going to be uh, deductible. Notice here, we also have a second home. So you would think that would be more beneficial for more wealthy uh, individuals who could have two homes. And then of course, if we have the loans on the two homes, that could be a significant, a, a significant amount as well. So it includes first and second mortgages. So when we take out a loan, Oftentimes when we purchase the home, we're gonna take out a loan on it to be paying for the purchase price of the loan. We could take out a second, which could happen for various uh, types of reasons. But in essence, we have two loans. Typically, when you think of it from the banking side of things, the bank wants to lend you money and they want to assure that you pay the money back. They're gonna be obviously earning interest the way that they assure that is they use the loan as collateral so that if you default on the loan, they can go after the home and they don't want to do that typically because they just want to be collecting uh, their interest, but they have the threat of being able to do that is the general idea. What if you have two loans outstanding? Well, then you might have one bank that has the primary recourse of the value of the home if it was to be uh, taken and sold. And then the second one has the secondary recourse. So you would think that you would have less favorable rates, for example, on the second than the primary because they might not have as favorable, the bank might not have as favorable terms in terms of the collateral. So first and second home equity loans and refinanced mortgages. So what's a refinance situation? If you have a home and you've got a loan on it, then at a future point in time, the interest rates on the market are going to change. So if the interest rates become lower on the market than what you purchase on the home, you might want to then 
refinance the home so that she can basically take out a, a, a new loan and, and basically restructure the loan. You can kind of think of it that way, hopefully getting a more favorable rate, which of course costs something to do to process that through, but then possibly you can lock down more favorable rates that hopefully you can have for a longer period of time. And then, so, so you end up in the same kind of situation where you have your home, you've got a loan with it, and you have the collateral of, of, the, of the home to back up the loan and you have interest on it that might be deductible. A home can be a house, condominium, uh, cooperative, mobile home, boat, or similar property. So when you think about what qualifies as a home, it's pretty wide. There's a pretty wide range of items uh, that qualify as a home. So it must provide basic living accommodations, including sleeping space, toilet, and cooking facilities. So those are probably the ones you're going to be looking at if, you, if you're living in just basically, you know, some something, a boat or something like that, and it doesn't have like a bathroom in it, then that's one of the things that, you know, you would think might disqualify it as a home. So check the box on line eight if you had one or more home mortgages in 2023 with an outstanding balance and you uh, don't use all of your home mortgage proceeds from those loans to buy, build, or substantially improve your home. So now we get into the issue of what did you use the proceeds of the loan for? And this gets somewhat complex. Normally, when you buy a home, you're going to take out a loan just to be purchasing the home. And so then you would think that that type of loan would be deductible because that's what the government is trying to basically incentivize uh, people to be able to afford a home as long as it's not, if it's in within a reasonable range, you would think they might put a cap on that. However, from the bank's standpoint, you can imagine they don't really care what you spend the money on as long as they have the recourse as of the home as collateral. That's how it would generally be uh, if there weren't, you know, like regulations involved and in, in so on. But if you take out a loan and then you use it not to improve the home or purchase the home, but rather to buy a car or to go on vacation, then then you would think that's not the goal of the IRS. That's not what they're trying to basically be uh, incentivizing. And that, of course, could lead to complications. So interest paid on a home mortgage proceeds used for other purposes isn't deductible on line 8A uh, or 8B. So see limits on home mortgage interest later for more information about what interest you can include on lines 8A and 8B. Now note that nor this could cause kind of issues when people are doing personal finance and they're trying to consolidate their loans. In other words, the home loan is, is one of the loans, the best loan to basically have as collateral sometimes because it would be at least if you can deduct the interest. So some people, when they have a lot of credit card debt or if you have a lot of uh, a, a car loan and other types of loans, then one strategy from a financial statement perspective or just a personal finance perspective would say, let's see if we can consolidate some of those loans, get rid of those high interest rates on the credit card and the car payments and so on, and possibly see if we can use the home as collateral so that that collateral might allow us to get lower interest rates because the, because the lender is more secured in that case. But if you, if, when you use that strategy, it's going to complicate things because you might not be using, again, the, the proceeds of the, of the loan for the purchase or improvement of the home. So then you have questions about the deductibility. So that could come up from a tax standpoint when you're doing the tax return and from a personal finance standpoint when you're trying to think about how to free up cash to do whatever you need to do or possibly in consolidating debts to try to take advantage of uh, lower interest rates, for example. Tip, so if you used any home mortgage proceeds for a business or uh, investment purpose, interest you paid that is allocable to those proceeds may still be deductible as business or investment expense elsewhere on your return. So if we took out the loan, so you could imagine a situation where you're saying, I need money to start my Schedule C business that I'm going to report on the Schedule C. I need to take out a business loan. What's the bank going to say? The bank is going to say, I need collateral 
in order for me to do that. If you have business assets like equipment, that might work as collateral, which would make sense because those are assets of the business and you're using the loan for the business. But as long as the bank has recourse, they don't really care, you would think, in theory, if it was a personal asset. In other words, if you say, I need a business loan, I'm going to put my home up as collateral on the business loan, then, then the bank, as long as the bank is, is confident that you're going to repay the loan, and if not have the backup of being able to take the collateral, the home, you would think that they still would want to basically give uh, the loan. But although the home is collateral, you didn't use the money for the purchase of the home or, or improvement of it. So you would think it might not be deductible on the Schedule A. However, you are using the proceeds for business purposes. And therefore, even though it's a personal collateral, you would think you might be able to take the interest as you would a normal kind of situation from an income, state, income tax system as a business expense because you needed the loan to purchase like equipment in order to generate revenue in the future, which is something that you would think would be naturally deductible uh, from an income tax perspective, but not on a Schedule A, possibly on like a Schedule C or other business area. Limits on home mortgage interest. So what are the limits? Your deduction for home mortgage interest is subject to a number of limits. So if one or more of the following limits applies, you can see publication 936 to figure your deduction. So once once we get into these limits, once they, they go into play, the question is, do these limits apply, number one? And then number two, if they do, then we got to get into the calculations to see how we're going to calculate the deductible part. So limit for loan proceeds not used to buy, build, or substantially improve your home. That's what you would think the IRS is trying to incentivize, at least in theory, because they're subsidizing the home builder market, right? So they want the loan proceeds to be used to buy, build, or improve the home. So you can only deduct home mortgage interest to the extent that the loan proceeds from your home mortgage are used to buy, build, or substantially improve the home, uh, the home securing the loan. So you took out the, 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 the loan using the home as collateral, and then you have to use those proceeds to, do, to, to buy, build, or improve the home for deductibility because that's why the IRS is having you deduct them. In theory, the bank doesn't care or wouldn't care, right? In in theory, they just care that can you pay that they you can go to, you go to Hawaii and go on a vacation and whatever as long as the bank feels secure that you can pay back the loan and they have the recourse if you don't of the of the the home. But so that's so that's where it gets a little bit tricky. So the fact that you have the home as collateral in other words doesn't necessarily mean that you qualify because you might have used the proceeds for something other than the buy, build, or improve. So make sure to check uh, the box on line eight if you had one or more mortgages in 2023 with an outstanding balance and you didn't use all the loan, all the loan proceeds to buy, build, or substantially improve. So the only exception to this limit is for loans taken out on or before October 13th, 1987. So they, they changed the law, which is some ways back at this point in time, but loans could be quite long, quite long in duration. So this is one of those areas that once they change the law, it becomes difficult because like I say, I would argue that the home mortgage interest probably should not have been in there. I don't think it should have been in there in the first place because it is a personal item. So, and, and all you did was subsidize the home prices, which increase the price of the home, making it more complex for people to purchase a home without, I think, really providing value in the long term because the market is just going to adjust for that. But once you have put it in place and people have made a 30 year investment based on the structure of the tax code, it becomes very difficult to take it out because now you're going to be harming the people that made their investments based on the tax code. So what you end up with is having these laws that say, I'm going to fix it from this point going forward. And then if you were there under the prior law, then it still possibly applies 
in, in that way. So the loan proceeds for these loans are treated as having been used to buy, build, or substantially improve the home. You can see publication 936 for more information about loans taken out on or before October 13th, 1987. You can see publication 936 to figure your deduction if you must check the box on line eight. So if you have to check that box, then the question is, how do I figure how much of the interest is deductible? And you would think that you would do some kind of ratio calculation. In other words, what's the portion of the loan that you used for the, the buying, building, or improving of the home versus for refinancing your debt or for uh, whatever, going on vacation or whatever to help to determine which part of the interest, that ratio, then you would multiply possibly by the interest amount on the loan. Because remember, what you're going to get is a 1098. And the 1098 isn't is going to give you the amount of interest that you paid, but it's not going to be breaking out the deductible portion versus the non-deductible portion based on what you used the loan proceeds for, because the bank isn't responsible to oversee what you use the loan proceeds for. Typically, that's not their job. The IRS hasn't forced them to do that yet. So then you're going to have to take that number on the 1098 and then apply it out or allocate it in accordance to how the loan proceeds were used, possibly using some kind of ratio percentage allocation, which you can go to the 936 publication for more detail. Limit on loans taken out uh, on or before December 15th, 2017. So this is a ways back. For qualified debt taken out on or before December 15th, 2017, you can only deduct home mortgage interest up to $1 million, 500,000 if you are married filing separately of that debt. So note that these limitations uh, are, they, they are pretty high, right? Because again, this is a deduction which they claim is, is aimed at everybody being able to own a home but the fact that you have multiple homes that are, are qualifying for it, which most people don't have, uh, like normal people, and, and they have these high, pretty high amounts. This is not the cost of the home here, $1 million. We're not talking about the cost of the home. We're talking about the loan on the home. So in other words, usually if you buy a home, it used to be that you put 20% down uh, at least right? So the, so you put a cash, substantial cash amount down, and the difference would be the amount that you paid uh, would, the, would be the amount that you, that you are going to pay with a loan by taking out a loan. Okay. So the only exception is for loans taken out on or before October 13th, 1987. You could see publication 936 for more information about loans taken out on or before October 13th, 1987. You could see publication 936 to figure your deduction if you have loans taken out on or before December 15th, 2017 that exceed $1 million, 500000 if you are married filing separately. So now the question is, is the loan over the cap that we're allowed to take? And remember that what you're going to get is a 1098, which is the interest paid on the loan within the year. So then the question is, how am I going to figure out if that were the case, which it isn't normally, that's a pretty high amount. But what, how am I going to figure out if that was the case, the deductible portion, which again, you might have to use some kind of ratio calculation you would expect. So limit on loans taken out after December 15, 2017. Okay. So for qualifying debt taken out after December 15th, 2017, you can only deduct home mortgage interest up on interest on up to 750,000, if you are married filing separately. So typically if a married couple uh, has the choice of either filing married filing store joint, married filing separate, can't typically go back to single or head of household unless separated or divorced. And typically you're beneficial to, to file married filing uh, joint normally. So if you, uh, if you also have qualifying debt subject to the $1 million limitation, 
discussed under limit on loans taken out on or before December 15, 2017. Earlier, the $750,000 limit for debt taken out after December 15, 2017 is reduced by the amount of your qualifying debt subject to the $1 million limit. An exception exists for certain loans taken out after December 15, 2017, but before April 1, 2018. So in general, like going forward, this would be the rule that's probably most relevant in your mind when because you're going to might have questions about people that are going to be purchasing a home or something like that and the deductibility of the interest, noting that anytime someone is thinking about planning situations, you're really going to want to use the software to actually run real projections to see what the tax implications are because they do get complex. So let's read this top one one more time. Your qualifying debt uh, taken out after December 15, 2017 can only deduct home mortgage interest on up to 750,375 if you are married filing separately of that debt. So it's still a pretty high number because we're not talking about the cost of the home. You might've still bought a million dollar home and then normally you would put it down a down payment usually it used to be like 20 percent and the difference is is going to be basically the loan amount which still if you bought that you know that would be a, a high loan for a large you know a very expensive place if you're not living in like california where i'm at right you might have home purchases that you know you buy the home for three hundred thousand or two hundred thousand or something like uh something like that you put the 20 percent down and you're so so you, so again, pretty decent limit for average people in America. Notice that this is another problem, by the way, with trying to put down a blanket kind of rule like this about purchasing homes over the entire country, because it's way more expensive to buy homes in, say, California, for example, or New York than many other types of the areas of the country. So it's hard to say what would be a fair deduction. And again, I think you're, they're getting into the weeds of this, getting on the personal side of things that actually causes more problems. But in any case, if the exception applies, your loan may be treated in the same manner as a loan taken out on or before December 15, 2017. You can see publication 936 for more information about this exception. See publication 936 to figure your deduction if you have loans taken out after October 13th, 1987 that exceed the uh, 750,000, 375,000 if you are married filing separately. Okay, so then we got the, the limit when loans exceed the fair market value of the home. So if the total amount of all mortgages is more than the fair market value of the home, you could see publication 936 to figure your deduction. Again, you would think this wouldn't typically happen because normally if banks are not influenced by some weird regulations and whatnot, then then they're not going to want to allow the value of the 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 home to be less than the loan value so if you think about if you're a bank and you're going to give out a loan you want to make interest on on the loan then if they have a hundred thousand dollar home that they're purchasing that's the purchase price you're going to say something like i want you to put 20 percent down or i'm not going to give you the loan and I'm going to use the loan as collateral so that if you default on the payments, I can then take the property, not because I want it, but because I want to sell the property to recoup the loan value, right? That's going to be the idea. But if if you give 100% loans, meaning the home is worth 100000 and you loan them 100000 what's going to happen if the value of the loan goes down? You can see everything gets messed up because then the people that are living it, that own the home are saying, hey, look, I'm paying a higher price on, on the loan than is the value of the home. There's an incentive for them to abandon the home, basically go bankrupt kind of thing. And, and so, so that doesn't usually happen. That's what happened in the housing crisis like 2008. Uh, and, and that's because there were these crazy incentives that were basically manipulating the market uh, in various ways and the banks were taking on uh, large risks. But normally that shouldn't happen because if you have a 20% cushion, when you purchase the home, it's not likely then the market's gonna decrease that large of an amount. 
but it could, right? And then if that happens, then you could have a limitation uh, as well. Okay, line 8A. Enter on line 8A, mortgage interest and points reported to you on form 1098. So notice 1098 is different than a 1099. The 1099 represents income typically that you might have received and therefore have to report. IRS has the same document, so you have to double check that. The 1098 is going to be reporting the mortgage interest. And it's it's kind of a different situation where the 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 usually when when it's income, note the incentive to the IRS was they want to go to the person that is paying because because they get the deduction, right? They're going to get a deduction, so they want then them to rat out who they gave the money to so that they can make sure that the other guy reports income. That's what a 1099 is. That's what a W-2 is. Here, what we have is uh, interest, which might be a deduction for us, but because it's such a large and significant deduction, they're going to put pressure on the big financial institutions, the banks that have the loans to actually report not only to us, but to the IRS, the amount of mortgage interest on the form 1098. So that, of course, if we report something different than what's on the 1098, then the IRS might question us about it. And we have to basically kind of justify or show why what we're reporting is different than what's on the 1098, for example, typically. So uh, unless one or more of the limits on home mortgage interest apply to you. So uh, for more information about this limit, see limit on home mortgage interest earlier. So we've got the home uh, mortgage interest limited. So if your home mortgage interest deduction is limited, you can see publication 936 to figure the amount of mortgage interest and points reported to you on form 1098 that are deductible. So only, so usually it's pretty straightforward. Hopefully they're not limited. If they are, then it's gonna get more complex and you can go to the publication to do that calculation or help you with it. I only enter on line 8A, the deductible mortgage interest and points that were reported to you on form 1098. Refund of overpaid interest. If your form 1098 shows any refund of overpaid interest, don't reduce your deduction for the refund. Instead, see the instructions for Schedule 1, Form 1040, Line 8Z. So this, I believe, is going to be a similar situation to like what we saw with the state uh, income taxes. In other words, what happens if last year you paid interest and you got a deduction for it in 2022, but for some reason it was wrong, you overpaid it, and then they gave you a refund in 2023. That means you over deducted in 2022. So should you go back to 2022, amend the return? Well, that would be kind of tedious. So I believe the idea would be, no, we're not gonna do that. Well, what do I do then? Do I reduce the amount of mortgage interest in 2023 because of the refund to make up for it? That would make sense. But the IRS is typically gonna say, no, that's not the way we want to do it because it's possible that you sold the home and you don't have any mortgage interest or you're not itemizing in 2023. So what would you do in that case? Instead, like with the state tax refund, if that happens, you might have to report it in income as other income. So similar kind of situation that's fairly unusual to happen because typically the bank's gonna get it right with that 1098, but same concept. And you can see it's been repeated multiple times if you get this situation with a refund and you're like, oh no, I have to amend the prior return or oh no, I have to adjust the deduction in the current return. The answer is probably no, you have to see if you got a benefit from it last year. And if so, compensate for it in the current year by possibly including it in income in and above the line like schedule, schedule one income. So more than one borrower. So if you and at, any, at, at least one other person other than your spouse, if you file a joint return, were liable for and paid interest on a mortgage that was your home, you can only deduct your share of the interest. So shared interest reported on, for, on your form 1098. So if the shared interest was, was reported on the form 1098 and you received deduct only your share of the interest on line 8A, so you can imagine a situation where you have a 1098 reporting the interest, 
but you are only allocated a portion of it that's that, that's basically your portion. Well, you can only deduct like your portion of it would be the idea. Let each of the other borrowers know what their share is. Uh, shared interest reported on someone else's form 1098. So here's where it gets messy. So if the shared interest was reported on the other person's form 1098, report your share of the interest on line 8B as explained on line uh, 8B later. So notice that if someone else is getting the 1098 and it's a shared situation and part of that interest should be deductible on uh, your return, that's kind of a risky situation. You would rather not structure the loan that way typically because the form 1098 is not only going to you, but to the IRS. So, so, it's, so if you report mortgage interest that you don't have a 1098 for, it's not tech, it might not be wrong, but it could cause more complications. So you wanna make sure that you do that carefully. And I would think through thoroughly if you're talking about, about how you're gonna structure the loan and use that as a last resort, uh, but you, that could happen in some situations. Form 1098 doesn't show all interest paid. So if you paid more interest to the recipient than is shown on Form 1098, include the larger deductible amount on line 8A and explain the difference. So clearly the IRS has the 1098. If you're with a large financial institution, you would think that they would get it right, get the right number. But sometimes you might have other financing other than with large institutions and whatnot, and some, they might get it wrong. So what do you do? Well, you have to report the correct number. You're going to report the correct number and then try to give the notes to the IRS to tell them what happened because the IRS has the number. And if you don't give any explanation, reporting something different, reporting something greater than what is on the 1098, you can expect that they will probably question that. So if you are filing a paper return, explain the difference by attaching a statement to your paper return and printing, quote, see attached, end quote, to the right of the, the line 8A. I think you can do that electronically now too. You can find, you can basically say, I'm gonna attach an addendum, a statement, which would be like a PDF file to, the, to, the, to it. Line 8B, if you paid home mortgage interest to a recipient who didn't provide you a Form 1098, report your deductible mortgage interest on line 8B. Hopefully that doesn't, that's not as common as an occurrence because again, you can expect the IRS is gonna question that more because they didn't get their 1098 from the financial institution, which would give you more verification and support that you have a legitimate deduction. So your deductible mortgage interest may be less than what you paid if one or more of the limits on the home mortgage interest apply to you. So for more information about these limits, see limits on home mortgage interest earlier. Seller financed mortgage. So this is kind of a special type of scenario where the mortgage structure is gonna be a little bit different, noting that usually if you buy a home, what happens is the person selling the home is gonna sell the home, let's say it's a $100,000 home, but they have 20,000 financed. They have a loan on it that they're paying. Well, usually you're gonna get a loan to help you to get the 100,000 that you pay to them. They're gonna take the money and then pay off the 20,000 of their loan and keep the 80,000 and go on their way. But you can imagine a situation where you, where you, where you, where you have a different kind of financing structure like a seller financed mortgage. So if you paid home mortgage interest to the person from whom you bought the home and that person didn't provide you a form 1098, write that person's name, identifying number, so you would think social security number, and address on the dotted lines next to line 8B. So if the recipient of your home mortgage payments is an individual, the identification number is their social security number, SSN. Otherwise, it is the employer identification number, the EIN, you must also let the recipient know your social security number. Interest reported on someone else's form 1098. So if you, at least one other person other than your spouse is filing jointly, were liable for and paid interest on the mortgage and the home mortgage interest paid was reported on the other person's form 1098, identify the name and address of the person or persons who received a form 1098 reporting the interest you paid. So now someone else got the 1098, 
you're going to report it because you, some of it's allocated to you. You want to tell the IRS who got the 1098 so the IRS can still kind of verify it with that 1098. Again, you would like to avoid that structure of a loan if possible because it, it, it's likely to cause confusion. Don't want to confuse the IRS. They cause problems when you do. So if you are filing a paper return, identify the person by attaching a statement to your paper return and printing the attached to the right of line 8B. You might be able to do that in, in software again as well, uh, depending on the software. So line 8C, points not reported on form 1098. So points are shown on your settlement statement. Points you paid only to borrow money are generally deductible over the life of the loan. So points become a whole nother kind of situation because sometimes there's different terms of what a point actually uh, means. Uh, so there's that becomes a problem. And then the question is, well, if you're paying points and we're considering the points, we're thinking of the points as a prepayment of like a payment of the interest, like a prepayment of the interest, do I get to deduct the interest at the point in time I pay the points? And the IRS argument might be possibly no, because you, you're paying the interest before you've earned it. That would be like prepaying the rent or something like that. So they might then force you to put the points on the books and kind of like depreciate them, which would be the easiest form of depreciating would be basically just uh, taking the points that you got to deduct and deducting an even amount over the life of the loan. So if it was a 30 year loan, deducting an even amount, which usually comes out to a pretty small amount each year of points that possibly uh, can be deductible. So questions that come up with points are, one, are they deductible? Two, if they are deductible, did the, the mortgage company uh, or the financing company put it on the 1098? And then three, how do I treat the points? Are they something that I can deduct in the current period or are they something that I can't deduct or are they something that I'm going to have to depreciate, put on the books basically as like a capital asset or an amortizable asset that I'll then expense over the life of the loan, possibly using a straight line method. Although in some cases you might have to use a more complicated method. That's a, the simplified method of straight line, which usually will work over the life of the loan, which would be like 15 uh, to 30 years is the general idea. If they didn't report the port points on the 1098, you might have to look at the closing document. So if someone purchased a home, they're going to have the closing document and you might have to scan through the closing document to make sure that there's a proper allocation of the points and then treat the points uh, accordingly. Now, obviously, this is only something that's usually a problem when the home was first purchased, where you have to comb over possibly the the uh, purchase documentation, the closing document. After that, everything should roll smoothly because you'll get the 1098s, which should be properly recorded after that. And if you had to record the points on the books and amortize them over the life of the loan, you would have done that in the year of purchase. And if you're using the same software, the amortization should hopefully work and properly calculate in future periods. In any case, see publication 936 to figure the amount, uh, the amount you can deduct. Points paid for other purposes, such as for lender services, aren't deductible. So refinancing. Generally, you must deduct points you paid to refinance a mortgage over the life of the loan. This is true even if the new mortgage is secured by your main home. So similar situation, except this time you had a loan, you want to refinance the loan, possibly because there are more favorable interest rates on the market than your current interest rate, which could result in another kind of closing document, similar but much more simple than when you purchase the home, which could result in more points, which you generally are going to have to basically amortize over the life of the loan. So if you use part of the proceeds to improve your main home, you may be able to deduct the part of the points related to the improvement in the year paid. So in that case, you can take a look at publication 936 for more details there. Tip. So if you paid off a mortgage early, deduct any remaining points and the year you paid off the mortgage. Let's say you have the points on the books. There's a 15 year loan. You've been deducting the points every year for 15 years. However, 
Now they're going to pay off the loan early. They're saying, I'm just going to pay it off. I've got the money. I'm going to pay it off. Well, I still have these points that are still scheduled to be deducted over 15 years. Because the loan is being paid off now, you would think that you would be able to deduct the, the points at the time that you're paying off the loan. However, if you refinance your mortgage with the same lender, see mortgage ending early in publication 936 for an exception. So now you have a situation where you're paying off the loan, but you're taking out another loan. So do you get to deduct the points of the loans if you're paying off the loan, but then you're just refinancing, taking out another loan, or possibly do you have to take those points and keep on amortizing them possibly to the life of the new loan uh, uh, or to the life of the old loan, you know, whichever is shorter or something like that. If that's a situation, you can take a look at publication 936.